So good morning, everybody. On behalf of the organizing committee, I would like to uh, welcome everybody to the 13th uh, annual symposium of the Center for Quantum Technologies. Uh, for those of you who do not know CQT so well, uh, we have been holding this symposium uh, uh, yearly since uh, the beginning of CQT in 2007. Uh, and uh, since a few years, we have been starting to give the program uh, a focus area and rotating this through different areas of interest uh, for the center. Uh, so for this year, it's loosely focused around the uh, foundational topics of quantum mechanics. Uh, and at this point, I would like to uh, uh, thank very much uh, the program uh, committee with Profs Quek, Berge Englert, uh, and uh, Valerius Karani for putting this uh, program together. I would already like to uh, um, thank the speakers for uh, making this possible uh, and joining this program. We are very much uh, looking forward to all the talks uh, and the discussions. And I would like to mention that our new director, uh, Jose Ignacio Latore, will give the closing remarks uh, later today. Uh, he's currently inconvenienced. Uh, so then I think uh, it's left to mention to me that the sessions will be recorded and uh, welcome again. And I would like to hand over to the uh, first session chair, Valerius Karani. Thank you. Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure to uh, speak of foundations in these uh, challenging times. And uh, uh, my task is to introduce the speakers and also to collect the questions. So those of you who have questions, as uh, was mentioned by Cassandra in the chat, please uh, write them in the chat. We will have limited time possibly for questions because every speaker has been allotted one hour, including questions. So uh, I will uh, select. And uh, uh, for the questions, I may call you uh, by name and say, okay, you have asked a question, please, please unmute yourself and ask it yourself if you uh, like so. Uh, very good. Now uh, we move to the first speaker, uh, Ruth Kastner. She uh, is a professor of philosophy uh, at the University of Maryland where uh, I think that to, uh, all of us today here in Singapore, we're still in the morning when we opened the news, we thought of Washington DC, where she's not very far from there. And she told us the situation uh, is stabilizing actually, thanks God. And so uh, without further ado, I will let give the, 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 the floor. Ruth, please. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me. And um, it's wonderful that you're uh, making this opportunity available, you know, remotely, especially in the in times of COVID, and uh, it's it's nice that we can do this. Um, first, I'm, is everyone able to hear me? Okay. Uh, at least I can. Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, good. And um, yes, actually, I, I'm currently living in upstate New York, so I'm not right uh, next to the the problems there in uh, in DC, but I have been watching closely and. Uh, so hopefully um, I can get my mind back on quantum theory, a little more uh, pleasant topic to think about. And um, what I'm gonna talk about is quantum paradoxes and how I think uh, this is my take on uh, why we are where we are with these paradoxes and how I think uh, we can maybe move forward in a kind of a new creative way to resolve these. So. Um, just the abstract, which you may have already seen, I just kind of briefly go through this. Um, Freshiger and Renner have presented a heightened version of the Schrodinger's cat and Wigner's friend paradoxes that raise serious concerns about the coherence of quantum theory and especially about the apparently elusive notion of measurement. I propose that we regard this class of paradoxes as a symptom of a fundamental but curable problem afflicting the standard formulation of quantum theory. The problem arises because a standard formulation is based on deeply seated, but in my view, on inappropriate metaphysical and culture, even cultural ground rules that, are, that I'm going to be identifying and disclosing for critical review. The main ground rule I'm going to critique is the idea that so-called real quantum theory has no real genuine physical non-unitarity in it. So I'm going to offer a specific counterexample that um, unlike many of the so-called collapse theories, it, it does not require any, any ad hoc changes to the basic quantum theory. 
so, it, so that it does not force non-unitarity. It is simply based on a different theory of field behavior in which that non-unitarity naturally emerges. So first I'm gonna go back and consider the Schrodinger's cat experiment. And um, I'm gonna argue that, uh, that Schrodinger actually presented his cat paradox not as something that he was hoping to predict that we would see macroscopic superpositions, but rather as, as a way of pointing to something that he thought was really wrong with quantum theory. So in that sense, I, I, I'd like to kind of um, represent this cat paradox as a reductio ad absurdum, meaning that it's, it's a way of taking quantum theory and saying, look, this is what it really leads to if you, if you take it in its current form and look at the implications. And he, it was really a critique on his part. It wasn't actually something that um, in recent years seems, seems to be sometimes taken as, as something that we should be looking for, even though we can get somewhat large superpositions the idea of, of a really full-blown you know, cat that's both alive and dead is, is something that Schrodinger meant as a critique of quantum theory. Um, and so it's actually never gone away. This basic problem, let me just go back for a second, um, has been brought to a head by the latest version of this paradox that was, um, that was uh, presented by Froschiger and Renner in 2018. So just before I go further, um, I, I, a paper came out um, uh, I had a paper come out last year in which I present some of the arguments I'm going to be presenting so that if, you know, we're going through this pretty quickly, if you want to review some of these ideas, this is where you can find it. And I can certainly provide that reference um, later if people need it. So going back to a comment by Nicolas Gizin in 2017, who said that the quantum measurement problem is a serious physics problem. Serious because without a resolution, quantum theory is not complete, as it does not tell how one should, in principle, perform measurements. So I, I take his point here, and I think that we have not really come to grips with this issue. And, and this is pointed out by this froschiger renner paradox. So just to kind of briefly review, it's based on the Wigner's friend paradox. And uh, this is consists of imagining that uh, Wigner has a friend, F, who's in some box in a laboratory. The box just represents a laboratory. And, and Wigner is outside. Okay, so, so his friend is, has, say, some kind of a quantum system inside that box, inside that lab. And, and it's in a, some kind of a superposition, say, of, of spin up and spin down. And then he measures his system. Um, in terms of spin in a particular direction. And he finds what he regards as either a spin up result or a spin down result. However, meanwhile, uh, in quotes by unitarity, which is the general assumption about quantum theory, um, W, Wigner, supposedly must continue to describe F and his, even his entire lab by this superposition of whatever the current prepared state of the system was in so that, so that the system is uh, begins in in this little uh, up arrow state with the subscript s. Let's see if I can. Okay, yeah. So he's that's the system, and then the friend becomes correlated with that. So the unitary story goes, and so that you get this this ongoing superposition. So the uh, the froschiger renner paradox exploits this problem, and what it does is um, I don't go into the technical details here but it, it, it uses two F level observers who are say inside a lab and it takes two of the W level observers who are considered to be outside the lab and we can call these super observers, if you will. And, and Froschiger and Renner construct a scenario using specific states and specific interactions in which um, the F level observers and the W level observer, observers must actually disagree about the probabilities for a specific measurement outcome that could be in principle measured. So that rather than we're just going uh, with the usual kind of schrodinger cat paradox, we don't simply have a situation where we have a macroscopic object in a, in a kind of crazy superposition that we know we never see, but in, we've gotten something even worse now. We have an actual quantitative prediction 
about uh, in principle observer, observable quantity that could be measured, but that these two sets of observers uh, disagree about what that probability should be. So we get ourselves into a, a big problem here if we, um, you know, if we have these premises that led to this, to this outcome. So um, going back again to, to the root of this inconsistency is the fact that F, the, the friend in the lab, is seeing a definite outcome. Yet, according to the usual unitary only assumption, the assumption that quantum theory really is only unitary, um, that formulation of quantum theory does not allow W, the outside observer, to describe F or his system as really being collapsed. He's not allowed to according to the rules of quantum theory as they are usually understood. So this is really, um, I argue in, in a little more detail in that, in that publication that I mentioned, this is the root of the inconsistency that we get. And so naturally these, uh, this kind of situation where the, the officially um, accepted version of quantum theory basically does not allow one to attribute outcome identified eigenstates to their measured system. They're simply not allowed to because, because there's nothing in the theory that, uh, that it allows you to say that a collapse has occurred or that reduction has occurred or anything like that. So strictly speaking, you're not allowed to. And according to the unitary only theory, whenever someone is attributing such an outcome uh, identified eigenstate to their system, it's actually, it has to be a fiction according to the standard theory. So it can't be the real, uh, you know, ontologically correct description if you really take, if you insist on the idea that quantum theory really is unitary only. Because if it really is unitary only, then it forces you to use this, this superposition and this, this ongoing entanglement that, that continues to get bigger and bigger as more and more degrees of freedom interact with the original system. So that, so that you are just prevented by the usual assumption about unitarity, about ongoing unbroken unitarity. You are prevented from ever attributing this kind of eigenstate to a measured system. So given that inconsistency where we have these two different descriptions at the different levels of, of observation, that is what allows uh, Froschiger and Renner to obtain this paradox is that there really is a fundamental inconsistency at work here. So, um, so we have this situation um, and I've uh, kind of summarized this as, well, where do we go from here? And in looking at the literature, um, sometimes what I see is, um, of course, we do see discussions in the literature about, well, how can we get around this? And one of the evasions that is, is, is talked about is the so-called uh, non-unitary collapse theories, which are not the kind of theory I'm going to talk about, but are rather the, the ad hoc um, versions that attempt to change the theory and to introduce some kind of a nonlinear dynamics that forces a collapse. So people generally agree that, yes, you could evade this, this froschiger renner paradox by using one of these theories, but understandably, most people don't like those theories because, because A, you are, well, A and B, or I was gonna say really amount to the same thing, because you're changing quantum theory. You're really saying um, that you're, you're that you're just not going to use quantum theory, you're going to change it and, and use something else, which understandably a lot of people don't want to do, and I certainly don't want to do that either. Uh, on the other hand, some people, uh, uh, some people in the literature kind of um, view this as a way of, uh, since they, since they um, assume that quantum theory really is unitary only, they view it as something that must be inevitable, that in some way, the, the problem of measurement that is what leads to this contradiction and this, and this inconsistency is something that's just inevitable and we should just accept it uh, and, and acquiesce to this and, and sort of accept the idea that, well, quantum theory uh, in the terms, in the words of the Froschiger Renner paper, cannot describe the use of itself, <laughs> that, that that's something that we should be okay with, okay? So um, I, would, I would say, no, we don't need to be okay with that and we don't need to accept that. 
But another alternative is to regard the situation that, that has been placed before us by Froschiger and Renner as, as a kind of incontrovertible evidence that there is a fundamental problem with the standard formulation of quantum theory. But I'm going to argue that it's fully curable so that um, we don't have to reject quantum theory, we don't have to change it, but we, we need to look at it from a different um, point of view and a different understanding of the way fields work. So um, that's kind of what I'm going to get into in the next part of the talk. And I like to kind of re refer to um, this person named Paul Arden, who was not a scientist, but a, some kind of a uh, publicist who um, was very successful. And he said that, he quote, said, quote, if you can't solve a problem, it's because you're playing by the rules. So what I'm going to propose is that there is in fact a simple and elegant solution that has been overlooked because we're, we've been subject to these deeply seated metaphysical and even cultural ground rules that I think are overdue for critical examination. So that's what I'm going to turn to next. So first, what do I mean by quantum theory in its standard formulation and playing by the rules? Well, as I've alluded to already, the, the standard formulation of quantum theory has the assumption that it's really unitary only and that real so-called real quantum mechanics has no real non-unitarity. Okay, so, see. so in other words, it's assumed, it's assumed that the only real dynamics is this um, time dependence of the quantum state, which is given by the time dependent Schrodinger equation. And it, in terms of which we've got um, the uh, time evolution operator, which is a unitary operator. I don't know why I've got <laughs> a little side down there. Uh, okay, so the part of the uh, standard approach is assuming that any non-unitarity is confined to an ad hoc projection postulate, I, which I abbreviate PP, for which there is no theoretical model. So it's just sort of a postulate and you just kind of pull it out of the air because you're trying to um, take into account that in fact, we always see determinate outcomes. We don't see you know, Schrodinger's cat in, in a superposition and so on. So um, it also, in addition to this unitary only assumption, it assumes a particular theory of field behavior and in this theory, this is the standard approach of physics to the way fields propagate. Uh, it's assumed that quantum state propagation is unilateral. And, and I mean, by that, I mean, it depends only on something emitting, creating a quantum state. And what I call this the baseball picture of physical processes. So let's just kind of, uh, a little picture here of a, a baseball uh, player here. Now, actually to be more accurate, I really should have had him have a tea, one of those tee ball things where he's just got a little, um, you know, rather than having the pitcher throw the ball, which puts it in play. The, the picture I have in mind here is that some, a single person or entity can unilaterally just hit that thing, emit that system, and it goes out and it does whatever it wants to do or whatever the laws dictate that it does. And that, you know, nobody needs to catch it or, or nothing else needs to happen in order for that ball or that, that emitted system to go along its merry way autonomously. So I know when I talk about this, it's kind of this, this second aspect of the standard approach is something that we all assume. You know, I, I grew up assuming it. I got into physics assuming it. I, it's just, it's like, obviously, it's like one of those things that's as obvious as the, the sun going around the earth. No, I'm just kidding, you know, because <laughs> I mean, you look at things and you see it. That's, you think you're seeing that, right? So it's just something that seems like obvious. And what I'm going to argue is in fact, well, no, it's not, it's not actually, it may not be the way nature really works. Okay, so um, this is the standard way of looking at field propagation in physics. And the problem, but the problem is that it doesn't actually account for radiative processes, for example, it uh, doesn't account for the loss of energy by a radiating charge or the gain of energy by an absorbing charge. And I can uh, go into a little bit more detail on that later, but the, this unilateral picture is, is something we see you know, in, the, in our everyday lives. It's based on the kind of classical local level uh, 
and th these kinds of processes that we see ar around us. So, but what it does is it amounts to imposing classical preconceptions on the quantum level. So in specific terms, um, the, the unilateral propagation is a classical preconception. The, the locality, the idea that information must always travel at no more than light speed is, is a classical kind of concept. And the idea that energy must always be localized at some space-time point. Uh, and again, these are, these are sort of standard ground rules of physics. So what I'm presenting here is a little bit radical in the sense that what I'm saying is we should maybe question these and take a step back and, and at least recognize that these are assumptions based on our ordinary macroscopic experience, but in fact, they're worth questioning. So, so I turn this the sort of bucket brigade picture. And just to kind of have a little graphic picture of this, it's the idea that you've got some kind of a source of, um, you know, I, I have, call this the emitter. So this bucket of this big container of water. Well, how's that water going to get from one place to another? Well, clearly we've got to have some intermediaries. These are the localized field operators, the guys with the hard hats. They represent your localized field operators with their buckets. And, and the standard approach in physics is, look, we, we cannot have anything like energy and represented by the water here going from one place to another unless it's done this way a nice local you know respecting relativity and so on to the final destination which we then just dump the water in and it just sits there passively so this is kind of what i call the the bucket brigade picture of of energy propagation or information propagation more generally However, there is a different theory of field propagation out there, and it accounts for radiative damping, uh, the loss of, of energy by an, an accelerated charge very nicely. It's called the direct action theory or the absorber theory. It's less known and it's less popular. And it, um, it says all of these preconceptions are actually wrong, okay? So we do not have unilateral propagation. We don't, don't in fact have this kind of locality. We don't have information always traveling at no more than the speed of light. And we don't have energy always localized at some space time point. So you can see why it was less popular because it had, it was also called an action at a distance theory. And that's a kind of taboo, you know, that's, that's not something you're supposed to do in physics. So, you know, from that standpoint, we can see why it wasn't that popular. So um, along these lines, um, the, there's an interpretation of quantum theory that was proposed by John Kramer in the 1980s, which he called the transactional interpretation. And this is based on the absorber or direct action theory of fields. And Kramer showed how using this picture of the field behavior, you could, you could get, um, and of course, the original proponents, Wheeler and Feynman, actually showed this at the classical level. They showed how you could get energy propagation from an emitter to an absorber if you had um, both of these entities actually generating a time symmetric field that was out of phase in such a way that, the, that when the, the absorbing system responds, its future directed field is canceled by the future directed field of the emitter and the past directed or advanced field of the absorber uh, of the emitter and the absorber are also mutually canceled so that ultimately you get you get a total reinforcement between the emitter and the absorber and you get the total cancellation beyond them so this nicely gives you a picture of energy being transferred from the emitter to the absorber and Kramer used this to argue that um, quantum theory could be interpreted this way and it could be proposed that the, um, the responses of the absorber, which were had an advanced field character, but past directed character, that including those would give you a nice account of the Born rule for probabilities. So this is what, what piqued my interest and why I started exploring this interpretation. So just to kind of say a little bit more about how this works in, in the transactional picture, the usual quantum state Kramer called an offer wave and the advanced response of, of absorbers to, to these uh, emitted offer waves are called confirmation waves. So the, 
the quantum state uh, as we know it, as we usually represent it by, by a ket, is like an offer for, for something to be absorbed, something to be uh, transferred. And it will, um, in general, be received, co components of it will be received by many different absorbers. So each of these absorbers, say an absorber with the property A, can only, re can only receive this particular component of the emitted offer wave and so on. So these different absorbers, and usually, typically these are things like angular, uh, not angular, but um, spatial momentum, directional momentum with um, an offer wave kind of being emitted uh, spherically, isotropically, so that if you have many absorbers around it, they're going to be able to receive different directional momenta, but certainly not all possible directional momenta for each of them. So in that way, they are receiving just simply a, a projection of that initial state onto whatever component they represent. So then each absorber's uh, response has an advanced response, um, and I hear I'm I'm ignoring the the forward pro, uh, retarded future propagating component of that response. They they both emit or generate a time symmetric field, but right now we're just looking at the components that are between the emitter and absorber, or that 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 um, constitute that interaction between emitter and absorber. So um, the advanced response of each absorber is. Uh, is the adjoint basically has the form of the adjoint of the component that it received. So these little hands reaching to the left represent those advanced responses. Now it turns out that mathematically, you, um, I can get to that in the next slide, but what you get is um, what I call incipient transactions. So that each of these interacting components separately sets up a possible transaction in which you could have a transfer of conserved quantities from the emitter to one of these absorbers. But since only one of them can receive this, if it's, for, for example, uh, a single photon in the field, clearly this single photon cannot go to all of these different absorbers. It has to pick one or one, one of them has to kind of win this competition. And so only one of these absorbers can, can actually receive the real energy and this is what corresponds to quantum collapse. Now, if we look at, at the mathematics of this, we can see more explicitly that the interaction of the offer and its advanced confirmation is actually represented by an outer product. So this is what the outer product of these two, two quantities looks like. Each of them has its own outer product. And when you form this outer product, you see where the Born rule comes from here. You get the Born rule and you get, sorry, get this uh, Born rule multiplying or weighting a projection oper operator representing that particular outcome where that's uh, the A is absorber A receiving it, B and so on. So they're each naturally weighted by the Born rule. And so in this picture, you, you naturally get this kind of non-unitarity, you get this, this collapse and you get the Born rule without changing quantum theory. So um, the nice thing about this is that it actually gives us a physical basis for the, the famous um, process one of von Neumann. He called this process one. It's basically the non-unitary measurement transition, which in, in, the, in the literature is typically viewed as simply a mathematical representation of the projection postulate. It's not viewed as something that physically occurs. But, but uh, what I've just shown hopefully is, is that um, in the transactional picture, because it's based on this different theory of field behavior, von Neumann's process one is a physical process, that, that there's an actual uh, physical description of this process and it is non-unitary and it's something that really happens in the world. So that when you have this measurement type interaction, it's, it, what it is is a non-unitary interaction that really gives you this non-unitary measurement transition such that you end up with, um, you know, technically speaking, it's called a proper mixed state. You, you know, the sum of, of all of these weighted projection operators is a proper mixed state, meaning that 
it represents a real fact of the matter in the world that, that one of these outcomes has really occurred or is really occurring, being actualized. And here I've represented that by the uh, blue shaded, you know, the middle one say, this is a case where these are all incipient transactions weighted by their born world probabilities. But in fact, it ended up that the reduction or collapse occurred with respect to absorber B. And that is the absorber that actually received the energy. So while the other absorbers played a part in that they, they were involved in this interaction and, and it is a real physical process, they ended up not receiving any energy. And, and these are actually null measurements. So that's what a null measurement is. If say you're monitoring this detector and you, you, know, you, undergo, you're, you, you conduct your measurement process and you say, oh, you know, the photon did not end up at this detector, that's a null measurement. And in fact, you know that it had to have ended up somewhere else, but you know that in fact, a measurement did occur and, and particular detectors, some, some will not receive any real energy, but, but that's a null measurement. And in fact, a measurement did occur. <clears throat> okay, so, so the cure for the, uh, the Frost-Sugar-Renner inconsistency here is that in fact, his friend does see a definite outcome because there is one. And when he, uh, he, there is a measurement transition, there's a non-unitary process in which the measured system that F is working with ends up in a, an outcome that is represented by either this projection operator up or this one down. And the correct description by W then is not a superposition, but in fact, it's a mixed state because in fact, there was a real physical transition that led to an epistemic mixed state so that it would not be correct for W to apply a unitary only evolution to that system if it in fact did undergo a measurement interaction that resulted in real physical non-unitarity. So we can see that this does a nice job of resolving the, the paradox that we never get to the point where we have um, a disagreement at the level of, of different observers about how to describe a system in which one of them has, has um, conducted a measurement, the other one maybe wasn't around or who wasn't privy to this measurement and somehow uh, end up having to, they end up having to give different kinds of descriptions. In fact, when, given that there is a measurement, they are both able to describe the systems involved by, by mixed states and there's no inconsistency. So here I'm gonna just briefly, I don't have a whole lot of time left. Um, uh, why, it, we, we seem to have a good solution here. Why is it still generally unpopular? Well, I, I summarize this, this by saying Wheeler, uh, by, by you know, representing it by this quote, Wheeler and Feynman were two smart guys who abandoned their direct action theory. And the thinking is certainly, you know, these were both really, really smart guys. So there must be something wrong with it if they abandoned it. But in fact, um, they only abandoned it because it didn't serve uh, their, their main purpose of eliminating self-action. It turns out that you do need some limited form of self-action of a charge with its own field in order to account for things like the lamb shift and so on. Um, that, so that's why they turned away from it. Um, and it turns out that in the, self, in the uh, direct action theory, when you do have remaining self-action, it is defanged in a sense because it does not involve energy. It's really only force. So it's just self-force because it turns out that, that these kinds of self-interactions are unitary only and they, and they, never, have, uh, they never have a situation where um, an electron say can, can transfer a photon to itself. You could just never have that. And I can't go into the, you know, the, all the details about why, but I do have, further references on that for people who are interested. So um, the, the, uh, the direct action theory also solves some inconsistency pro some problems in quantum field theory. And I have a reference on that for people who are interested. And then finally, to just kind of, you know, as proof if people are still dubious about Wheeler and Feynman um, running away from this theory, uh, later in his life, Wheeler did return to it, and he said some some laudatory things about it, which I've I've kind of uh, quoted here. It says um, the this theory swept the electromagnetic field from between the charged particles and replaced it with a half retarded, half advanced direct interaction 
between particle and particle. It was the high point of this work to show that the standard and well-tested force of re radiation reaction on an accelerated charge is accounted for as the sum of the direct actions on that charge by all charges of any distant complete absorber. Such a formulation enforces global physical laws and results in a quantitatively correct description of radiative phenomena without assigning stress energy to the electromagnetic field. So that's just your, you know, your evidence that in fact, there's nothing wrong with this theory. Um, another reason that, that it has not been terribly, uh, has not been embraced by a lot of the community is that there was an objection to it by Tim Maudlin in 1996. Um, and I don't have time to go into that now, but he, he raised a consistency objection to the transactional picture. Uh, it was an interesting objection and a good and a worthy challenge, but it turns out that it's really not at all fatal and, and it has been multiply refuted and multiply resolved. And, and recently I showed that, um, that in fact, when you take the relativistic level into account, the Maudlin setup cannot really be mounted at all. So you, you just in fact don't have the slow moving offer wave that you need in order to get that objection off the ground. So that just such an entity just such an entity just does not exist. So that's pretty much been disposed of as a real objection. Um, and then finally, um, I just want to suggest that maybe um, some of the re reluctance or resistance to considering this picture is based on certain metaphysical and even cultural kinds of views and, and ground rules that we need to take a look at and get a little distance from. So we can look at this idea of unilateral propagation, what I call the baseball picture. And, and in terms of Eastern, um, the Eastern kind of yin yang philosophy, the idea that there's balance in nature and that there are a kind of a complementary set of forces, or classes of forces in play in all of nature that, that are the yin and the yang. And in this unilateral propagation picture, what we basically have is all yang and no yin, because the, the idea is that you have a creation, emission, um, generation, production, uh, these kinds of yang sorts of elements. And what's completely neglected is the idea of reception, um, dissolution, absorption, uh, response, all of these things uh, are part of the yin dynamic. And this, this aspect is something that is not considered to be, uh, you know, really, it's just not noticed in, in Western thought. Uh, and so there's kind of a, kind of an idea that the only things that are real are things that are, are sort of these yang kinds of processes. But in fact, in nature, you know, you can't you can't just toss out a daffodil bulb and just go, okay, I'm done. You know, you nothing actually happens unless you have reception, unless you have response, and and all of these yin types of of dynamics are very real and and they are crucial to having a process occur. So I would suggest that maybe Western approaches need to kind of at least notice this and consider whether maybe what we're really, what's really going on in physics and in quantum theory at a fundamental level is that there are yin elements in play and that in fact, quantum theory itself does not foreclose these. It's only the field, uh, the, the field description, the, the underlying assumptions about the way fields behave that foreclose these elements. So again, you know, what I've, what I've just shown is that we're not changing quantum theory at all. All we're doing is saying, you know, that fields behave in a different way, that we need not just emitters, but we need absorbers to play an active part in order to produce um, at the relativistic level. It turns out that you must have both emitter and absorber to actually even create a real photon. This is a, a real, you know, hunk of energy that without active participation by both the emitter and the absorber, you cannot even get a real photon. So this, is, this idea comes out of the way fields behave, 
a different picture of the way fields behave. It is, does not come out of, you know, I want to change quantum theory or I want to add nonlinear dynamics to it or anything like that. So it very naturally just falls out of the theory of the, the, this theory of field behavior. And it is all completely consistent with quantum theory at all the way through from the non-relativistic -relativ to the relativistic level. And I show this quantitatively in some of my um, references that I can offer people later. So um, given that you know we're probably a little bit over time here, I'm not gonna spend much more time on the rest of my slides here. We just, this is a cultural aspect where um, in, uh, in reproductive biology, the, the sort of yang element took over and the yin element uh, was completely left out and people found out that they really <laughs> needed to look at that more closely. And in fact, the, the whole um, reproductive process was, was being misrepresented in that the, the yin factor was, was very active and very crucial. All right, so I'll just kind of review here. This is just the, the very natural physical source of the non-unitarity that is von Neumann's process one that clearly defines measurement that you get from the direct action theory of fields. That's a little cartoon that I can show people later. Um, I won't go through this right now. And these are some, just some references here, which I'm happy to give people later. And thank you very much again for, for inviting me and, and for listening. It's been a pleasure. Okay, thank you very much, Ruth, for this talk that probably has uh, provoked quite a few uh, thoughts. Um, I have already two questions in the uh, in the pipeline, so I will ask these two persons to ask him in order. Uh, the first is uh, Wu Ijo, uh, if you want to unmute yourself and ask your question. Hello, Ruth, Hi. thank you for the presentation. Thank you. I can actually if you how do you measure the incipient handshake or like confirm they exist since you can only like you get a now reading at the end right so your question is about you know how would we empirically detect the incipient transactions um this is this is not something that you know, i guess the, the easiest thing to say is you detect that something actually occurred because of your empirical experience. And in fact, we only see one outcome. So in a sense, I mean, I would have to note that what, what we currently have is we already have a disconnect um, between the standard approach to quantum theory, which is unitary only, and our empirical experience, which is that, you know, when we measure things, we get, we get determined single outcomes. So in a sense, what we have already is an anomaly on the part of standard quantum theory. And what I would argue is that this transactional picture that gives us the, the mathematics of, of a non-unitary interaction that, lit, that, that predicts that you will only find a, a single determinate result is actually what's being confirmed already by our empirical experience. So, that's the way I would put it, is that, that your, your empirical evidence of the fact or the, of, the, of the mathematics of this direct action approach, that your empirical evidence is that in fact, we do not see the superpositions or the, the unitary only uh, macroscopic superpositions that the standard theory gives us, that the standard theory predicts something that we fail to observe empirically. And so in that sense, we already do have the empirical evidence. So uh, now, of course, you can't directly, um, you cannot go directly and say, uh, okay, I'm gonna go out into the world and find three incipient transactions for three different possible places that my photon could end up because there's just no way to do that. A lot of quantum theory is what I would call sub-empirical in that sense. So that just sort of applies to the, the kinds of processes that, that quantum theory describes is that they are, they are not open to view in that sense. For instance, the other thing you can't, you can't directly measure is things like the non-local correlations in an EPR pair, you know, in, in a, a EPR entangled pair, you can't, you can't go, oh, look, I'm, I'm gonna find a way to measure the idea that you know, one of these pairs 
uh, one of these electrons is sending information off to its partner on the other end of the galaxy to tell it to end a certain, you know, with a certain spin orientation. So quantum theory doesn't let us directly observe certain things, but I would argue that we already have the empirical evidence for, for you know, reduction and collapse in the fact that that's what we see. Thank you, Ruth. Okay, <clears throat> by the way, I uh, wanted to say that Ijo is an uh, undergraduate student here. Now we uh, ask, uh, the next question is by uh, Eric Cavalcanti from Griffith University, an uh, established researcher in the field. Eric, please. Uh, thanks, Ruth, that was an interesting talk. Um, at the very least, it makes me want to have another look at transaction interpretation. It's been a while since, uh, since I looked at it. Um, I wanted you to clarify uh, about the Freiheit Renner paradox. Are you saying that the transaction interpretation rejects one of the assumptions of the theorem or that it um, rejects the predictions of quantum mechanics for that scenario because a collapse occurs or are you saying that there is a mistake in the proof somewhere but it wasn't it wasn't it wasn't clear to me uh, uh -huh. the kind of resolution you're giving to the to the to the yeah uh, let me just go back just to so you will i can give you the uh the, the paper where i go into a lot of detail with, that answers all of your questions in detail uh so that you can okay this is the one okay so so this is a paper in which I, I go into significant detail in, um, <clears throat> so I would, uh, I'm trying to think, um, I would reject the, their characterization of the universality of quantum theory as meaning that it is unitary only. So I think, I think there's nothing wrong with quantum theory. I simply say that in fact, quantum theory is not unitary only. So that's the level at which I, I you know, I'm disputing the, I'm, I'm disputing the, the, the common assumption that so-called real quote unquote quantum theory is really unitary only. So, so I, what I'm saying is no, real quantum theory could definitely easily have non-unitarity in it if you're using the direct action theory of fields. And if you do that, then, then you don't get to the, uh, the so-called super observers <laughs> macroscopic superposition. You just never get that because it would not be a correct, um, it would not be a correct theoretical description of the system. Right, so then just to clarify, then, then the, the particular set of predictions that the super observers supposedly would observe according to the analysis in Frank and Rena would not occur. That's correct. That the, the, yes. Right. right. Okay. That's right. That the super observers predictions would, you know, that, would, that would those fit. are bogus. Yeah. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. Thank you, uh, Eric, for the question. The next question is from uh, Rahul Jain, a PI in CQT here, computer science. Uh, Rahul, please. Uh, hi. Uh, yeah. Hi. So uh, thanks for the nice talk. Uh, so uh, I, 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 actually, I'm not a, a, a physicist. Uh, so uh, so uh, uh, you know, uh, maybe my question may sound a bit naive. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, so uh, so in 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 the in this uh, model uh, that you're proposing, right? So you're essentially saying that. Uh, uh, we can have collapses, right? It doesn't have to be all unitary, uh, uh -huh. uh, and 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 then uh, so so the question is that uh, you know so in our real world experience, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Basically, it, the macroscopic uh, pieces of information are always seen as uh, just one, right? They're never seen in superposition or anything. Mm -hmm. So. So, so, so uh, whenever, uh, let's say, a, m a microscopic uh, system gets entangled with a macroscopic piece of information, right, which is what happens when we, for example, do a measurement in the lab, right, mm -hmm. we kind of correlate a, a microscopic system like an electron or photon with a, a macroscopic uh, apparatus, right. So, uh, so whenever this uh, kind of a correlation happens, what we see in the real world is always something one, right? We just see one uh, outcome that that pops out. Right. So, so this collapse thing that 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 you're proposing, right? 
uh, at in the model or in the mathematics where does it distinguish between a, a microscopic pieces of information and macroscopic pieces of information right because yes. it is only for the macroscopic pieces of information that uh-huh. we see necessarily that is definitely a collapse i mean at least in our uh, uh, real world experience and yes, and, well, and the second uh, related yeah. question is that if we always see a collapse for macroscopic pieces of information right then uh, does it have any implication for the size of a quantum computer that we can build so suppose we can really build very large quantum computers which will require very large systems to be in superposition uh, which kind of start to near being macroscopic systems then that mm-hmm. is not going to be allowed in the model Right. Well, it's a great question you asked. And in fact, I have very quantitative answers to this whole issue of the the micro versus macro boundary, if you will. And it turns out that at the relativistic level of the transactional interpretation, which I've I've developed and I now and I call that RTI, um, there's a a specific domain it's not it's not a hard line but there's a range that you could call it the mesoscopic range at which collapse becomes more and more likely so that but there's a probability the basic probability that collapse will occur that this non-unitary process will occur is is dictated by the fine structure constant so in fact the you know it's and it's basically the square of the electric charge so that quantity governs the likelihood that you're going to have this non-unitary interaction that um, signals that heralds the transfer of real energy and the collapse. And that can happen at, it just simply happens with a probability and that turns out to to correspond directly to decay rates. So I can uh, can provide those those details if anyone wants to look at these references, but I do give a quantitative criteria for criterion for that transition. Now what it turns out that it does depend on what kinds of substances you're working with, how reflective they are, how 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 many absorbers systems that are capable of behaving as absorbers which are bound states. So and the kind of bound states you're working with and the transition specific transitions from initial and final states that would be available were such a um, non-unitary interaction to take place. So in other words, in order to transfer a real photon from an emitter to an absorber, you have to satisfy the conservation laws. And that's one of the guide or one of the conditions that has to be met in order for this non-unitarity to occur. So so you have the the transition probability for the relevant transition. And you also have, and that has within it, if you work it out, it has within it the fine structure constant, which is the basic amplitude for a photon to be emitted or absorbed. And since they, it has to be emitted and absorbed, you get two factors of it, which gives you the fine structure constant. So you can give a very quantitative criterion for that. And that actually explains, it dovetails very nicely with so-called decoherence, where we, we observe the effects of decoherence that are making it hard for people to build quantum computers. So what's traditionally described as a decoherence effects uh, that tends to be a circular description in a unitary only approach because um, you know you don't have real collapse in a unitary only a- approach and you have to describe decoherence in terms of other you know uh, diagonalization and so on. But in the in the um, collapse picture of the direct action transactional picture, you actually get a very nice physical account of these decoherent effects that uh, line up, quite well with the empirical findings of decoherence theory. And I have a paper on that too, if anyone needs that. But, but that is in fact why people are struggling to build these macroscopic superpositions. They are, they are struggling because of what's traditionally viewed as decoherence, but you can actually quantify that very nicely in the transactional picture. I hope that addressed both of your questions. I'm not sure it, it did. Uh, I, I, yes. Uh... So, so, so in your model, mac- macroscopic superpositions. So you, you're saying that you know there is a, always a probability that the collapse keeps taking place as as the systems become bigger and bigger. So in in your model, still macroscopic superpositions are possible, or they just completely ruled out that you just can't have well, them. I can. You can calculate that, and you end up with um, a, of a negligibly small probability 
that you could have that superposition. Uh, put differently, you end up with an overwhelmingly large probability that you're going to get collapse. So you know, and it, it, it's it's a huge it's a huge number. So so that in principle, it's it's not zero. Let's put it that way. It's not zero, but it's so small that you know it would be the end of the age of the universe before you could ever do it, and that kind of thing. So 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 it's kind of uh, suggesting that building a large uh, uh, several qubits quantum computer would really really be. Uh, difficult. It, it would, according to this theory I'm proposing, but you also basically get the same result if you just use traditional decoherence theory, because it turns out they, they empirically uh, dovetail very nicely. They, they, and and my, my theory actually supports the, the standard decoherence theory in a physical sense, in that it predicts that you're going to see decoherence at the levels that we already do, but it simply provides a nice non-circular account of why we get the decoherence. Is we get it because there's real non-unitarity. So, so in principle, it is still possible in your model. Uh, uh, it's, it's 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 as possible as it would be uh, under standard decoherence theory, which means still very very hard. But uh, again, they they arrive at the same empirical predictions so yeah okay thanks very unlikely but yeah so we um besides the fact that we don't have any more questions we had another question that was already answered during the uh the exchange so the person told me that no need to ask and besides we have uh, reached the time to uh move to the next talk so we thank uh ruth again for her talk thank uh, you